Well, hello and welcome to North Star Oasis for another jam-packed, action-filled information overload. I'm your host, Jeff Williams. Are you bundled up and is it, are you staying warm? Now, if you've been watching the show with any regularity, uh, whether you're on TV or uh, watching it through your television set, watching it through Facebook, facebook.com slash northstaroasis, or on YouTube, youtube.com slash northstaroasis, you will have noticed that what we are facing now weather-wise is not to be unexpected, that we have been following Joe Bastardi from Weatherbell and playing occasional daily updates or Saturday summaries. And since October, when his modeling predicted we're going to have a cold December, well, here we are, the last Thursday in December, and it is frigid. Yes, it is frigid. But if you were to believe the local meteorologists or the local uh, newspapers, they, it would make it sound like it's a catastrophic event that nobody had seen this coming. Well, we've been bringing this news to you since October. So we're going to show you today, Jan uh, December 28th, 2017, Joe Bastardi's daily update to show you what's going on with the weather and what we can expect for the next 7 to 14 days. Right about analytics, meteorologist Joe Bastardi, your daily update. Here's, uh, here's tomorrow through, uh, I guess, the 2nd of January. Um, the uh, temperature's outrageous, cold forecast on the models. This is Arctic on. This is uh, back in early December. We're saying that this, uh, we, this period, December 21st through January 10th, will be the coldest since 2000, 2001. If it beats that, it may actually wind up beating that. You have to go back to 83, 84. And uh, this is the 6 to 11, which is still very cold. This is greater than 8 Celsius below normal, this uh, blue shading over here. So if you look at this, let's take uh, northern Indiana over here. Uh, this is uh, greater than 15 Celsius below normal. So let's say it's minus 30 here uh, for five days and minus 15 Fahrenheit. And then we go into here and it's still about minus uh, 8 or 9 uh, Fahrenheit. Just a fantastically cold period. And uh, for those of you who follow... Uh, what we've been saying since October, we were expecting this. The December to remember, big holiday season this year as far as cold and the threat of snow goes. Uh, you saw the uh, Christmas Eve situation. We got a clipper coming along, and uh, even though it's after the New Year, a major storm up the eastern seaboard uh, next week is in the cards. It fits the pattern. Uh, as far as this clipper goes, uh, you can see large-scale one- to three-inch snows here. I think there's going to be more in New Jersey and Long Island also with this. Uh, the Emperor of the North is coming. I think it's cold now. Well, there's even more cold coming. And he loves to lay down a carpet, a white carpet, to walk in on. Now, here's the five-day means of the European. And whenever, whenever you get this blocking up here, frigid air uh, fights into the United States. And uh, you can see the trough of... Uh, back here off the west coast, the 6 to 10, this is how you get major storms, where you have the deep negative in here, and we're going to have to watch for a big uh, storm in, uh, along the eastern seaboard next week. Bitter cold. Now, there's six spots that I look at. See these six spots as to whether there is a great Arctic outbreak. And the last time all six of them hit this criteria, my criteria, was back in 85. They all, all six of them have to hit. For instance, if you have a zero degree day in Chicago, I think that's a great outbreak for Chicago. If you could get it to zero in New York, I think that's a great Arctic outbreak. You get it to 10 in Dallas, 10 in Atlanta, 26 in Brownsville, 26 in Orlando. But to have all of those do it at once is extremely rare. Now, the European has 20 in Dallas, 36 in Brownsville. So it doesn't, it doesn't have it there, but it has minus four for one of the days in Chicago, four below in New York for low, seven above in Atlanta, and it has a devastating threat uh, for a freeze in the Florida citrus belt. So the, the problem you have here, this and this line up to line up this. In other words, the model is making sense with itself. It's not like it's, uh, 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 you know, there was a trough up in here and it had this, you'd be saying, well, that doesn't look right. So uh, we've got a lot on the table, and uh, 
hopefully you stay with us here at Weather Bell. By the way, 5,000 foot temperatures, absurdly, obscenely cold into the uh, southeastern part of the United States. So, uh, uh, you know, we, we picked out the period December 7th. Well, you know, I put some periods on there before the fact. So December 7th through January 5th would be comparable to we had five analog years that we showed. All right, we had 89 in there, where we had 95 uh, was in there, 2008 was in there, 2010 was in there, 33 was in there, if you remember. So it, it, we're going to be close to that. Um, and uh, then, then what I did was uh, to emphasize the holiday season, as we get closer, I say, okay, we'll go back and look at December 21st through January 10th, 2000, 2001. You have similar temperatures uh, as far as um, the nation, and you're, you're seeing that happen. So I think, uh, I won't say it was perfect. We'll say it did have merit. did give you a jump on the situation. But you be the judge of that, okay? Enjoy the weather. It's the only weather you got. So one of the things that that should tell us is that as much as we've heard about climate change and global warming as being something, you know, and especially man-made global warming, then why are we having the coldest period since 17 years ago or 34 years ago? Why are we into such a deep freeze when all of the global warming models predict that we should be burning up right now? And what we're seeing with Joe Bastardi is an actual scientific and historical look at the weather to show that cycles repeat themselves. We get warming, we get cooling. We get warming, we get cooling. We uh, covered a couple months ago the hurricanes, especially as Hurricane Irma was going through Florida. And we have active hurricane years. We have quiet hurricane years in the Gulf. I mean, everything goes in cycles. And that's one of the things that we've discussed on this show at length is that there is a cyclical pattern to the climate and the weather. And what do we see from today with Joe Bastardi? That when these six points hit this, it's rare. And he's, he mentioned what, four of them, or five of them, or, you know, are pretty much there already, almost all six. And that you notice then there are certain things going off in the Pacific and off in Canada and Alaska that we get cold weather here. It happens. And so instead of hearing all the alarmists, let's just try to recognize and understand the patterns so we can better prepare. So now what does that tell us as Minnesotans here in the end of December, beginning of January? Bundle up for another week. That the stuff's not going to go away till after the 5th or 7th of January. After that, we'll see what the new models say, we'll see what Bastardi has to say, and we may actually start seeing a little bit of a warming trend that maybe it's not going to be you know, quite as bitter after this goes away, or maybe we'll end up still having more of the same with chronic Alberta clips. We don't know, but this Arctic blast is going to hang on to us for another week. That's really all we need to be concerned about. What do we have to do to survive the next week? Notice I got a couple of sweaters on, I'm bundled up. Uh, the more we stay bundled up, the warmer we are, the better off our attitude is going to be. But I'll tell you this, my attitude is I can tough it up for a week because I know, according to Bastardi, that that's how long this bitter stuff is going to last, is about a week. No need to say that this thing is stalled and it's going to be on here perpetually. Yeah, a big headline in the Pioneer Press was that it's going to be, you know, around zero uh, for the end of, to the end of the year, which is like three or four days. We can handle that. We're Minnesotans. Come on. So I wanted to give you that update to show you where we're at in this deep freeze and when it may start to lift and to let you know that all is not a climate catastrophe that the alarmists want to make it out to be. That this is cyclical, we'll make it through it, and then we'll go on from there. So now that means it's time for our Prager University segment, which is going to lead into pretty much the rest of the information overload for this hour. And that is going to be on where the federal government gets its money from. Every year, the U.S. federal government collects more than $3 trillion in taxes, and almost half of that comes from you and me, the individual income taxpayers. These are the taxes that come out of your paycheck, or maybe you pay quarterly. Either way, it's a lot of money, so it's worth learning about. 
So here are five things you didn't know about the individual income tax. Number one, the individual income tax has been the largest source of federal government revenue since 1950, accounting for 47.3% of revenue in 2016. Number two, while the name individual income tax implies that only individual Americans pay the tax, many small businesses are subject to it as well. A majority of small businesses are set up as pass-through entities, which means that business profits are included on the owner's individual tax sheet and is thus taxed at the individual rate, which is higher than the rates big corporations pay. Number three. According to 2016 data from the Tax Policy Center, 44% of Americans, or roughly 77 million people, don't pay any federal income taxes at all. Number four, a combined 2.6 billion man hours is spent every year filling out tax returns. That's an average of 17 hours per American tax filer. If time really does equal money, we're paying even more than we thought to Uncle Sam. And lastly, number five, According to the most recent data from the Tax Foundation, the top 1% of taxpayers contribute roughly 40% of all federal income taxes collected, and the bottom 50% of taxpayers were responsible for less than 3%. That's a lot of taxes paid by very few people. The individual income tax is what makes many of the benefits and programs provided by the federal government possible. But having the rate set too high can have serious consequences on the financial situation of individuals and their families as well as overall economic growth. Small business tax cuts is not a partisan issue, it's an American issue. Both Republicans and Democrats should be able to get behind legislation that accelerates job creation, raises wages, and strengthens communities. It's a win-win policy. To subscribe to our YouTube channel. Well, the Republicans got behind that legislation last week. The Democrats said no. Major tax bill. First time in 31 years that a major tax overhaul has happened at the federal level was passed by the U.S. House of Representatives, the U.S. Senate, and just before Christmas it was signed into law by President Trump. So we are going to, before we really get into a discussion about the tax bill, we're going to show you some of the arguments. This is courtesy of the Associated Press, so any type of selected, selective editing comes from them, not us. But we're going to show you the uh, lively arguments on the House passes the tax bill, and it's going to show both Republicans and Democrat members of Congress speaking. Now should be in order. History will indeed remember this vote. Future generation of Americans will remember who cast their votes to raise taxes on 86 million middle class households and heap another 1.5 trillion in deficits onto our children and to our grandchildren. And those of us who vote against it are doing so not because we oppose tax reform. On the contrary, we recognize, as most Americans do, that this bill is not tax reform. It is a tax giveaway to those who don't need our help, paid for by those who do. Mr. Scalise. You know, there are those on the other side that would say keep all the money in Washington, stunt economic growth, continue to let America be non-competitive, where we see jobs go overseas over and over again, large companies, thousands of jobs at a time, move into foreign countries because we have the highest corporate tax rate in the industrialized world. In our bill, Mr. Speaker, we cut every single tax rate and make it lower. That's more money in the pockets of hardworking families. On average, families are going to see over $2,000 more back in their paychecks every year. From California. And the next year, when people check their checks and realize they have more money, they're going to remember who voted for status quo and who voted to make the American come back. So don't vote for the status quo. Vote for a tax cut. Vote for reform. Vote for your constituents. Vote for your country. And vote to raise the paychecks of America. A lady from California is recognized for one minute. Outside the Congress, the American people have already made their decision. Polling shows that Americans oppose the GOP tax scam by a margin of two to one. Hardworking families see, the, see right through the brazen con job Republicans are trying to sell them. At the end of this vote, they will stand up and cheer 
adding trillions to the national debt in order to give tax breaks to the wealthiest 1% and to big corporations. They'll cheer that. And they'll cheer when they say we can't afford to protect the health of our innocent children. They'll cheer that. And remember, they will cheer when they tell you we can't afford the next step. We can't afford Medicaid, Medicare, and a dignified retirement our seniors spent a lifetime earning. That's, a, that's an applause line for them. The Speaker yeah, of the House is sometimes. recognized for one We are about to achieve some really big things. Things that the cynics have scoffed at for years, decades even. Ideas that have been worked on for so long to help hardworking Americans who have been left behind for too long. They hear about the economy getting better. They, they turn on the TV and they see the stock market going up. But now we need to make sure that these people in our communities, in our country who are struggling, see their own personal economy getting better. And that's what this is all about. The mission that drives us here today is to restore this beautiful American idea. What is that idea? That the condition of your birth does not determine the outcome of your life. You can work hard, play by the rules, get ahead, and make a better life for yourselves and an even better one for your kids. And with a vote of 227 in favor and 203 opposed, the conference report was passed through the U.S. House of Representatives. Before we actually discuss the bill and its uh, consequences, we are uh, actually going to take a close look as we do try to get a local tie in there. And we're going to show you Congresswoman Betty McCollum, Minnesota's 4th Congressional District. Uh, which is the heart of our viewership. This is her statement on the floor of the House of Representatives regarding the tax bill. Mr. Speaker, I rise today in strong opposition to the Republicans' tax scam. The middle class receives virtually no benefit from this bill. This bill hits middle class Minnesotans especially hard by dismantling the state and local tax deduction. It increases costs for college students and their families, it abandons adoptive parents, and it punishes people with high medical bills. So why does this bill hurt hardworking families? So President Trump and the Republicans can pay for giveaways to the wealthiest Americans? Big corporations and billionaires will see their taxes slashed. Wealthy heirs and heiresses will be allowed to dodge taxes entirely, while the top 1% of Americans receive nearly half the tax cuts. 99% of us will be stuck with a federal debt that will explode by trillions of dollars. Mr. Speaker, this Republican bill is not tax reform. It is not a good deal for the middle class. It is a scam, plain and simple. I oppose it, and we must defeat it. Okay, so Congresswoman McCollum calls it a scam, which is pretty much the same thing that Nancy Pelosi said. Where do you think Betty McCollum got that from? Here is a couple of things in a nutshell. First of all, increasing taxes on corporations and increasing taxes on the wealthy has not exactly helped the American economy in the, pa in the previous administration. That's been, that happened for eight, in the last eight years. We did not have a single quarter of growth in the GDP above 3% in the entire eight years of President Obama's administration. We have not had tax cuts during the Obama administration. We have had tax increases, increase in regulation, increase in fees, increase in regula you know, the, re the regulatory authorities, uh, regulatory bodies from the federal government under the, under the administration of you know, the presidential administration, uh, where constitutionally all of these regulatory agencies exist, they would be punitive against companies. That's happened all the time. For, uh, for a good por portion of the Obama term, we would hear constantly about this company being fined this mega amount. This company would get fined this record amount. How many times has General Motors been fined? Million dollar fine here, five million dollar fine here. All of these companies through regulatory action would get fined. Taxes would go up for the top 1%. Corporate tax rate would be the same, if not higher. And then we expect to actually see a pro-growth economy. Let me show you a chart here with the Minnesota Individual Income Tax Collections. Now, if you take a look, now, uh, okay, thank, uh, thankfully we took our uh, banner off, but from 1977, uh, when the chart you know, was 
data first shows, all the way up to 2015, take a look at that. The Minnesota tax collection has always exceeded the growth of the U.S. Uh, the US average. Take a look from 2010. And take a look right there going all the way up. That happens to be the Mark Dayton and Barack Obama administrations. Mark Dayton, uh, Minnesota governor, Barack Obama, U.S. president. That's our tax collections. Take a look at the national average. All states. All states. Now keep in mind that I wonder how much of that growth for the U.S. average has been Minnesota's over collection of taxes. The fact is that we are collecting way too much taxes to the point, especially in corporations, to the point that that's where you start putting money into tax shelters. That's where businesses start going overseas with their money. That's where they, they offshore the money because of tax considerations. Uh, let's take a look at the next, uh, the Minnesota tax burden. Uh, this is uh, how Minnesota ranks in relation to other states. Now keep in mind this is as a fiscal 20, uh, 2012, so we're going back a few years. And Minnesota is at 10.8%. Uh, I can't quite see that from here. 10.8, and then the U.S. average is 9.97. My eyesight from where, where my monitor is it, uh, it's not quite there. Now, if you take a look, below Minnesota is Wisconsin, but keep in mind that when they had Governor Jim Doyle in Wisconsin, that tax burden uh, rivaled and exceeded Minnesotans, but with Scott Walker as governor, they've made some inroads since fiscal year 2012. I wish I had an updated uh, chart. Unfortunately, I don't, because I would really like to see where that sits now. It wouldn't surprise me if Minnesota's a little higher. Wisconsin in the U.S. average is probably a little bit lower, but that still shows that amongst our peers, Iowa, Indiana, uh, Texas, South Dakota, you know, we're way overboard than perhaps what we should be. And as I mentioned, you know, Wisconsin should actually be lower. So a tax scam, but it seems to me that the tax scam is more like what we've seen, the status quo that has not given us job growth, that has not improved our economy, that has not improved wages. I hear Betty McCollum argue for an increase in the minimum wage. Did you ever stop to think about why wages are low in the first place? why there has to be a minimum wage increase just to catch up. Now, I'll give you two reasons here. I'll give you two reasons here just off the top of my head. One is the national debt doubled under the Obama administration. It went from $10.626 trillion up to about $19.93 trillion in the course of eight years. So what does that mean? And we've covered this more intently in the show before. I'm going to give you just the very basics. We have increased the money supply by twice as much during that time, which means there are twice as many dollars floating on the marketplace as uh, what there were previous. Now, yes, this is a very simplistic answer, trying to keep it down for uh, non-economists to try to understand. Whenever we throw out so much money, that means the value of the current money that we have goes down. And for the sake of argument, it's going to be inversely relational to how much we've thrown out. So we've doubled it. That means our currency is valued at half. That means inflation over the course of eight years has increased the prices. So that means that if you're living on a $9 minimum wage, your money is not able to stretch quite as much as it used to. Now, perhaps if we balance the federal budget, reduce the national debt, and uh, improved the U.S. economy, we would be able to take more money out of the money supply and be able to increase the buying power of the dollar, which I think is a more novel approach. Uh, corporate taxes. The corporate tax rate was cut from 35 to 21% during this tax bill. That's actually a good thing. And there's actually one other thing, and that is a 10.5 repatriation tax, which means companies from over, who have money overseas, they bring that back to America, 
they pay a one-time tax of 10.5% on that. And then from there, they'll be assessed the 21% from here on out. Uh, that's actually a good thing. That means we're going to have more jobs. That means that the need for uh, tax inversions of like a company like Medtronic buying a company overseas and then moving the headquarters of the consolidated company into the overseas for tax considerations is not necessarily needed as much anymore. We'll be able to get more manufacturing back in the U.S. And then one other thing about this tax bill. For the entire duration of the Obama administration, companies have been flush with cash. And what have they done with that cash? They haven't exactly expanded their operations. They sat on it. They bought back a lot of shares of stock with surplus cash. But the reason they did that was always waiting for the other shoe to drop. When are the taxes going to go up? When are the regulators going to come after the company? And how many lawsuits are they going to uh, have to fight off? And, and so they've been very conservative with their spending of the surplus cash. Now, when you have a tax bill and it cuts the rate, and that you see that the regulatory, the re a lot of the regulations have gone, uh, and you see that the regulating authorities aren't fining companies as much, there's a more willingness to start releasing those ca that cash flow back into the economy and grow the economy. See, during the Betty McCollum, Barack Obama administration, during that eight year period, all we've done is grown government, but we haven't grown businesses. But businesses are where the jobs are. So now, let's hear what Paul Ryan has to say after passage of that tax bill. I want to start off by thanking the American people, our constituents, for sending us here to do this work for them. This is one of the most important pieces of legislation that Congress has passed in decades to help the American worker, to help grow the American economy. This is profound change, and this is change that is gonna put our country on the right path. We said in 2016 that it would take real tax reform for families and businesses to get the American economy growing, and we were serious. And the American people placed their trust in us to do this work for them, and today we're making good on that promise. We're fulfilling that promise. And this promise being kept today is one of the most important things we could do to get the U.S. economy growing faster, to help people get bigger paychecks, to have a fairer tax system, and to simplify the system so people can have more peace of mind. I think the comparison is a non sequitur because the Affordable Care Act proved to be extremely unpopular. The Affordable Care Act proved to reduce health care choices, to raise premiums, to make health care unaffordable. This is going to do the opposite. This is going to grow the economy, it's going to increase paychecks, it's going to increase take-home pay, and that, I believe, is going to be very popular. On January 1, Americans are going to wake up with a new tax code. In February, they're going to see withholdings go down so they see bigger paychecks. And April 15th will be the last day they have to comply with the old bad system. This is a good day for America. This is a good day for workers. This is a great day for growth, and we're very excited about this moment. In Now, I'm going to go back just a minute here. I mean, you hear Paul Ryan explaining how things are going to be good. There are a couple of things that Betty McCollum did mention that I do want to address. One is the um, mortgage rate deduction. Prior to this, there, I think it was a million dollar uh, cap. If you happen to have a home that's, uh, that's uh, valued at a million dollars or more, then at, uh, you know, you're, uh, you've got a restriction on how much you can deduct on your mortgage interest. And this bill caps that at $750,000. Okay, so if your home is valued at $750,000 or more, you've got a cap on how much of your mortgage interest that you can deduct. Now, other than places like, say, North Oaks and Minnetonka, uh, Shorewood, you know, some places like that in Minnesota, it doesn't apply to the average person here. It really, really doesn't. It does not apply uh, because most people don't have mortgages that are exceeding $750,000. And like I say, there are exceptions to the rule, so that doesn't mean that it doesn't apply at all. But the average home value in the Twin Cities or actually in the state, well, just Twin Cities, is probably what, anywhere between two hundred dollars and $350,000? Yeah, you're going to be fine. 
if, if that's what you're paying on your mortgage, if, you, if, you're, if your house is assessed at $350,000, $400,000, you're fine. It doesn't apply to you. It applies to places like New York or California that the average house value is much greater. The other is uh, a, a cap of $10,000 on your state and local taxes. For many years, on, you would, you would uh, have a deduction on your federal taxes of, uh, you know, equal to the amount that you paid in state taxes. Places like Minnesota, New York, California, Hawaii, especially if you're upper income, you know, you wouldn't be paying your, you'd pay your, your state and local taxes and then you would write it off on the Fed, essentially making every other taxpayer in this country to, to subsidize you. And that goes away to $10,000. So if you're paying more than $10,000, yeah, you're going to get hurt a little bit there. But at the same time, that does show a more of an emphasis on if you think you're being taxed too high, then maybe you ought to talk to make some changes at your state and local levels and get those taxes in line with what you want to pay. But yet it's Betty McCollum, and keep in mind, those who, can, who are benefiting from, a, uh, from an unlimited cap on the state and local taxes are your rich people. And here, Benny McCollum and Nancy Pelosi and Senator Chuck Schumer are all arguing for a tax break for the rich. You notice that? They, call, they complain about a tax scam and tax breaks for the rich, but yet what are they protecting? They are protecting tax breaks for the wealthy. That's what they're trying to protect. The medium home price in Minnesota is $250,000. Like I say, the $750,000 cap does not impact too many people in Minnesota. It doesn't. $10,000 state and local tax, yes, yeah, some people in the upper income brackets are going to get hurt. But at the same time, a reduction of the corporate tax may offset that. So who's got the tax scam here? I think that Benny McCollum, Chuck Schumer, and Nancy Pelosi arguing for, higher, uh, for lower taxes for the wealthy, I think that's a bit of a tax scam. Let's take a look at the Senate side and what did they do? Inhofe, Isaacson, Johnson, Kennedy, Bennett, Blumenthal, Booker, Brown. Mr. The Sergeant Arms will restore order in the gallery. On this vote, the ayes are 51, the nays are 48. The Senate recedes from its amendment and concurs in H.R. 1. With further amendment, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act is passed. And of course, you can't get through the U.S. Senate without having the Democrats having a form of verbal protest, which I'm starting to say, does it really work? Their forms of obstruction and protest really work. It didn't stop you know, war. The anti-war protesters never stopped the war. The war continued. It didn't stop Trump's election, no matter how many times they marched. It's not stopping a tax bill from getting passed no matter how many times they want to yell from the gallery. Have they ever, ever stopped to think that maybe what they're doing is counterproductive? Just an observation. Anyhow, Republican senators did celebrate after the passage of the tax bill in the Senate. Let's take a look. <laughs> Don't want to read too much into a quarterly growth rate, but it's worth noticing. We've had three, uh, two quarters in a row of 3% growth. Stock market is up. Optimism is high. Coupled with this uh, tax reform, America is ready to start performing as it should have for a number of years. I have to say that uh, this is a historic night 
The Democrats have said that the American, will, American people will remember this night. I hope they do, because we passed one of the most important tax breaks in this country's history. There's no doubt that this tax reform process was about the American family, the American people. We have delivered on an important opportunity. That opportunity is to see more money in your take-home pay. This is a good night. You know, we set out with two goals. <clears throat> One was to deliver direct tax relief for the hardworking families that we all represent. And the second was to take what's arguably been the worst business tax code in the world and turn it into one of the best because the result of that is more investment, more growth, more new businesses, more expansion of existing businesses, and that means more jobs and more opportunities and a higher standard of living for the people we represent. It's a big night. To my mind, this is really a referendum on whether we still believe that the American dream is alive. We don't believe you have to settle for anemic growth, flat wages, and fewer jobs and the jobs that we do have, too many of them being shipped overseas, never to come back. So we weren't willing to settle for the status quo because we believe that America can do better. And thanks to this important historic piece of legislation, I think all of the incentives and the pieces are in place for the American economy to take off. My view of this, if we can't sell this to the American people, we ought to go into another line of work. I think this is an important accomplishment for the country that people will value and appreciate, but obviously it requires us continuing this discussion uh, with the American people, and we're all going to be doing that uh, all through the year. So that's what the Republican U.S. Senators had to say at the passage of the tax cut bill through the Senate. Now, there was a little bit of reconciliation that needed to happen. There were a couple of things in the House uh, bill, in the House, um, when the House took up the conference report that didn't exactly jive with the Senate rules. So the, the House had to come back and repass it, which they did, and we'll get to that in just a moment. So there's a little bit of procedural uh, stuff there that the House had to pass it twice. But let's hear what President Trump had to say about the passage of the initial conference report from both chambers. And this looks like it will probably be our last cabinet meeting until the new year. But who knows? You never know what happens with cabinet meetings. We have had some really great and productive ones. And this will be one of celebration because of what took place last night. We had a historic victory for the American people. It'll go through final passage today in the House. The heart of our bill is a tremendous amount of relief for the middle class, including a doubling of the child tax credit and a nearly doubling of the standard deduction. That's going to be tremendous for people. They're going to start seeing the results in February. This bill means more take-home pay. It will be an incredible Christmas gift for hardworking Americans. I said I wanted to have it done before Christmas. We got it done. The individual mandate is being repealed. When the individual mandate is being repealed, that means Obamacare is being repealed because they get their money from the individual <coughs> mandate. So the individual mandate is being repealed. So in this bill, not only do we have massive tax cuts and tax reform, we have essentially repealed Obamacare and we'll come up with something that will be much better whether it's uh, block grants or whether it's taking what we have and doing something <clears throat> terrific. But Obamacare has been repealed in this bill. We didn't want to bring it up. I told people specifically, be quiet with the fake news media because I don't want them talking too much about it because I didn't know how people would. But now that it's approved, I can say the individual mandate on health care where you had to pay not to have insurance. OK, think of that one. You pay not to have insurance. The individual mandate has been repealed. So I'm trying to actually find right now, uh, I forgot to mention about the standard deduction. I do have the current year 2017 standard deduction amounts. So this is your deduction when you file your taxes coming up in uh, April of 2018 for the current 2017 year. It is $6,350 for single taxpayers. 6350 for married taxpayers filing separately, 12700 for married taxpayers filing jointly, 9350 for heads of households. 
Now, uh, I'm trying to see here. I got the, what is the tax bracket? Uh, standard deduction amounts. Okay, so now, of course, what the standard deduction is is that just for being a taxpayer, you know, you essentially, I'm, I'm, I'm dumbing this down, so again, I'm not getting into a long discussion here, uh, but really it's your first, the, the amount of uh, money that you make, your first X number, like your first $6,350 is going to be tax-free. That's really what it comes down to. Um, and yes, I know it's a little more complicated than that. Uh, for 2018, now that this bill has been passed, uh, you're, if you're single, your standard deduction amount is 12000 If you're married, filing jointly and surviving spouse is 24000 If you're married, filing separately, it's 12000 If you're head of household, it's 18000 So again, you go from... 6350 for a single taxpayer up to 12000 for a single taxpayer. If you are a married taxpayer filing separately, you go from 6350 to 12000 uh, If you're 12700 for married taxpayers filing jointly, it goes up to 24000 And then if you are a head of household, it goes from 9350 up to $18,000 up. Essentially doubling in certain categories, just maybe like 45-47% uh, increase. But still, that means that you can earn more before you actually pay taxes. That's what the doubling of the standard deduction hits. So when I hear Betty McCollum talking about how the middle tax is essentially getting screwed from this, the middle class is benefiting from an increased deduction right off the top. This does not include your mortgage interest deduction. This does not include the fact that if you're middle income, chances are the uh, state and local tax you know, uh, cap isn't going to affect you that much anyway. So how is this a bad deal for Minnesotans in the 4th Congressional District? It really, really isn't. And then, of course, uh, in the last few years, we've been dealing with the individual mandate, which means that you have to have insurance, health insurance, otherwise you get a fine, and that's gone away. So that's going to be a good thing. Um, so that's where we're sitting at. Now, of course, the tax bill had to clear Congress, that, uh, the House, that second time. Let's take a look and see what they did. Mr. Speaker, both the House and now the Senate have taken action on, bill, on legislation to reform America's tax code for the first time in 31 years. Unfortunately, two targeted provisions did not meet Senate rules and had to be removed. Today, the process continues to move forward, and with this vote, it'll be the House, the People's House, that officially sends this historic legislation to President Trump's desk. I know the American people are excited. More than that, I know they are feeling a sense of relief. Today is a very sad day in the history of America because we have on the floor probably the worst bill in recent times to come to the floor. That doesn't mean it doesn't have stiff competition from other legislation the Republicans have brought to the floor. But this is the worst, because so many people are affected in such a negative way. The President just said in the last few minutes the most important part of this legislation is the corporate tax cut. Stop the nonsense that you're doing this for the middle class. Yay. Worst bill in 29 years with Obamacare, don't sell yourself short. So. Today we have a choice to make. We can either stick with the status quo, we just heard it. We can t take bold action to overhaul this broken tax code and restore hope and opportunity prosperity to Americans. Our choice is clear and we have made ours. We will vote to send this bill to President Trump's desk to get real tax reform done for the American people for the first time in 31 years. We will deliver for the American people. I encourage my colleagues to join me in support of this bill. The question is on the motion by the gentleman from Texas. All those in favor will say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. no. The ayes have it. The motion is agreed to. The gentleman from Massachusetts. Mr. Speaker, with that I ask for the yeas and nays. The yeas and nays are requested. <laughs> on this vote, the yeas are 224 and the nays are 201. The motion is adopted. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. Now. 
So now the bill passed the House, then it passed the Senate, and then it passed the House again. Everything is reconciled. The bill is passed and now awaiting the President's signature. And we're going to hear from the Senate side, the Senate Democrats. Your Senate Democrat leader, Chuck Schumer. Now we know they're popping champagne down Pennsylvania Avenue. There are only two places where America's popping champagne. The White House and the corporate boardrooms, including Trump Tower. Otherwise, Americans have a lot to regret. We think this bill is so bad uh, that it's very hard to fix in small little tweaks. Um, we'll see what they propose, but our view, we're going to hammer away at this. This is going to be a y issue for us all year. This is not just forgotten. The fact <clears throat> they say, oh, once people learn of what this is in this bill, they'll all be for it. Well, the Koch brothers have already spent tens of millions of dollars trying to persuade people this is a good bill, and the majority of Americans, by most polls, think it's a bad bill. And the reason is very simple. The suspicions of the American people that the Republican Party is helping the wealthy and the powerful corporations and not the middle class has been confirmed in this bill. The President does very well under this bill. Most of his cabinet does very well under this bill. M large percentage of his contributors do very well under this bill. Yes, the president is part of the top 1 percent, and the bill is aimed to help the top 1 percent. So the president's part and parcel to the problem. It now, of course, Senator Schumer, Schumer is going to say that, but notice that he just says it's a bad bill. But we don't, and granted, I know that that's selective editing from the Associated Press. That's where all, all these clips really came from is the Associated Press. So I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I sit there and selectively edit it because I have edited stuff in the past. But the fact is, this is what the AP has chosen to throw out there. But if there's such a bad bill, there's two things that I'd like to have heard from Senator Schumer. Why was it a bad bill other than the 1% benefits? I'd like to hear some more specifics from Senator Schumer. The other is, what do you propose to fix it? Because clearly what you have supported with President Obama has not worked. If it has worked, perhaps we wouldn't have had a need for such a tax overhaul as this. Not getting 3% growth in any quarter in a president, two presidential terms, that's not really helping the American people. And we've, you know, we've covered some of the provisions already here. And yes, you know, the corporate boardrooms are happy. But I really think that the Democrats want to harp on this, but I think they're afraid of something. And I think this is what they may not have thought out, is that they're on the wrong side of history. And by that I mean... What is going to happen six months to a year from now if the economy expands at a 4, 5, or 6% rate of growth? And not a single Democrat has voted in favor of the tax cut that led to that kind of growth. And then we get into the 2018 midterm elections. The Democrats cannot claim victory on a tax cut that they didn't vote for, which led to that economic growth. And that's not going to help them at the polls come a year from now, especially if it's combined with an analysis of before and after of what it was like under the Obama administration, especially when the first two years when they had the House, the Senate, and the White House, versus what we're seeing now when, you can, uh, when an increase in economic activity benefits more than just the top 1%. If this bill works as the way uh, Congressman uh, Speaker Ryan believes it will, we're going to have probably some unprecedented growth coming up in the very near future. If that happens, watch what Betty McCollum, Nancy Pelosi, and Chuck Schumer have to say, because they should not be getting credit for increased economic activity when they voted against the provisions that led to that. So, of course, the Republicans are going to celebrate. So here is another celebration, this time with President Trump. It's the largest, I always say the most massive, but it's the largest tax cut in the history of our country and reform, but tax cut. Really something special. 
This is going to mean companies are going to be coming back. You know, I campaigned on the fact that we're not going to lose our companies anymore. They're going to stay in our country, and they're going to stay in our country. And you've been seeing what's been happening, even at this prospect. But they have tremendous enthusiasm right now in this country, and we have companies pouring back into our country. And that means jobs, and it means really the formation of new, young, beautiful, strong companies. So that's going to be very, very important. And we did the largest tax cut in our history. We, I hate to say this, but we essentially repealed Obamacare because we got rid of the individual mandate, which was terrible. And that was a primary source of funding of Obamacare. We are going to bring at least $4 trillion back into this country, money that was frozen overseas and in parts and worlds, and some of them don't even like us, and they had the money. Well, they're not going to have the money long. And uh, so it's, it's really — I guess it's very simple. When you think you haven't heard this expression, but we are making America great again. You haven't heard that, have you? I think the and of course we're going to go right into when President Trump signed the bill just before Christmas. Uh, uh, Dallas, we're going to play the next two clips back to back. So let's go with his uh, discussion about Democrats regretting not supporting this bill. I think the Democrats will really regret. The Democrats already regret it. Uh, you know they have their typical thing. It's for the rich. They know that's not true, and they've been called out on it by the media, actually. But the Democrats very much regret it. They wanted to be a part of it. Just doesn't work out. But I really do believe, and I said on social media today, I, re I really do believe we're going to have a lot of bipartisan work done. And maybe we start with infrastructure. We've spent $7 trillion in the Middle East, not to mention all of the lives and all of the heartache. And it's so sad. $7 trillion. It's time for us to rebuild our country. Infrastructure is the easiest of all. We're very well on our way. We've essentially repealed Obamacare. Uh, you know, the individual mandate is a very big factor in this bill, frankly. A lot of people don't talk about it because the tax cut is so important. But infrastructure is by far the easiest. People want it, Republicans and Democrats. We're going to have tremendous Democrat support on in infrastructure, as you know. Uh, I could have started with infrastructure. I actually wanted to save the easy one for the one down the road. You know, one thing I really learned is I learned uh, and got to know and became very friendly with the people in the House, the people in the Senate, both Republicans and Democrats. Uh, when I came, you know, I didn't know too many. I was very politically active, but I didn't know too many. I think the fact that I've become friends with so many of the names that I just read off and so many of the senators, so many of the congressmen and women, I think that's a huge factor. I can call anybody now. I know every one of them very well. And I understand the legislation very well. As you know, we had the largest tax cuts in our history just approved. And I was going to wait for a formal signing sometime in early January. But then I watched the news this morning, and they were all saying, will he keep his promise? Will he sign it by Christmas? This is something that Republicans wanted for years and Democrats wanted for years, and yet it never got done. Who would object to trillions of dollars being brought back into our country? Nobody. But it never got done. Now it's being done. So this is the bill right here. And we're very proud of it. It's a uh, it's going to be a tremendous thing for the American people. It's going to be fantastic for the economy. It's going to keep companies from leaving our shores and opening up in other countries. We're going to sign this. This is a little picture of it. It fits nicely in the box. I said, take it out of the box because people have to see. And all of this, everything in here, is really uh, tremendous things for businesses, for people, for the middle class, for workers. And I consider this very much a bill for the middle class and a bill for jobs. And jobs are produced through companies and corporations. And you see that happening. Corporations are literally going wild over this. I think even beyond my expectations, so far beyond my expectations. So I'll sign this today rather than having a very big formal ceremony in two weeks when we were going to do it, because I didn't want you folks to say that I wasn't keeping my promise. I am keeping my promise. I'm signing it before Christmas. I said that the bill would be on my desk before Christmas. 
And you are holding me literally to that. So we did a rush job today. It's not fancy, but it's the Oval Office. So we won't do the whole thing, but this is basically what it is. That's your bill. But Mitch McConnell has been fantastic. Uh, worked so hard. Uh, we would speak at 3 in the morning and 2 in the morning, and we would speak whenever we had to speak. But he worked so hard. And the exact same thing can be said for Paul Ryan. Uh, they are very proud of this. And we're already seeing the results. And I, as I said, long before. And as he said, the, uh, we are already seeing the results. Quick rundown on companies that have already given worker bonuses after that tax reform package. AT&T, uh, more than 200,000 of its employees, including union represented and non-management workers, will be eligible for a $1,000 bonus. Uh, Boeing immediately announced $300 million in investments with $100 million towards corporate giving, including employee gift match programs, $100 million towards workforce development, training, and education, and $100 million towards enhancing uh, Boeing's workplace as well. Fargo, they, uh, they will boost its minimum wage to 15 an hour, an 11 increase from its current hourly rate. Pay will go into effect in March. Uh, Fifth Third Bank Corp, Washington Federal, Sinclair Broadcast Group, they're all paying bonuses, and there's even more out there that have been announced since this list. But since it is the uh, still the holidays and we're going into the New Year's season, we're going to show you the Pershing Zone U.S. Army Band Fife and Jump Corps with their Christmas presentation. <laughs> For Dallas Pearson producer, I'm your host, Jeff Williams. You're watching North Star Oasis. Reminding you, there's 361 shopping days left until Christmas 2018. Happy New Year. We'll see you next week.